Hello everybody, it is Fjeller. I have been working on this video for quite some time, and I know it's been long awaited, but it took me a little while to go through all the footage I recorded of this mode, and also trying to look up some stuff that I wasn't able to access myself due to my Chinese account being a little bit too weak. Uh, but finally, I can talk to you guys about the Dimensional Expedition. I don't think this mode is super complicated once you really sit down and understand it. There's a lot of new items, and really just one big new mechanic to deal with, uh, but for the most part it is uh, pretty much a more complicated Guild Wars, which I think is largely what people expected. So let's start with the basics. This mode was first run on the Chinese server starting on the 10th of December in 2020. It ran for 6 weeks, so it went until January 21st, uh, and if we were to continue following the exact same patches as the Chinese server, we are going to get this on the global side in May, and it will run through June. This Dimensional Expedition mode is only open to guilds that have achieved total domination on the Catastrophe rank of Guild Wars. Uh, in other words, the level 70 Guild Wars that we recently got. This is basically a higher tier of Guild Wars, but with a lot of extra mechanics added to it. As I mentioned a second ago, the mode lasts for 6 weeks. Uh, now I know some of you are already immediately worried because of that long 6 week runtime, uh, but let me first put one of the biggest concerns people might have to rest. This is not a mode where you have to play every single day like it was with Guild Wars, uh, where if you didn't play a certain day, you would have been quote-unquote wasting your heroes for that day. Uh, this mode uses a different way of using your heroes, which I'll explain in a minute. Anyway, just like the normal Guild Wars, uh, a guild leader is needed to start the mode. So be sure if your guild leader or leaders have not been around, uh, maybe check with them and see if they're good to play for these six weeks, or at least log on a little bit every day so they can check what's going on with the mode. Uh, because as I'll reveal as I talk about this mode, you'll realize that the guild leaders are very important to progressing the mode. Anyway, the premise of this mode is basically that you're sieging a kingdom. They're going to be using different maps in the future, but for this first one, it's going to be the Siege of Valdea from Langrisser 1. Uh, so some of you have, may have already seen some of the options that are there already on the global server. In particular, you're going to be separating your guild into four different squads, and each squad is going to have a leader. Uh, while each squad does move independently of each other, you are all on the same map. So if you take a look at the top image I have here, you can see that the mode is sort of split into three distinct sections. First you have the outer ring, which is the green names, you have six cities there. You have an inner ring, the blue names, which is also six cities. And finally you have the capital with the red name, Baldea City itself. Now capturing the capital in this mode does lead to an immediate victory, but you're not allowed to attack it immediately. You have to start in the outer ring and work your way in. The first guild on each server to clear the entire mode is going to get a special listing. Uh, but as far as I know, there's actually no special reward for completing it first, it's pretty much just for bragging rights. So if you want your guild to be bragging to other guilds in this dead game, uh, you know, have at it. There is however a leaderboard, and there are rewards from this leaderboard, and I will explain that later in the video when I talk about the rewards from this mode. So before we move on, I just want to make it clear of what I'm going to call each of the uh, sort of layers of this mode. So you have the overall map, which is the top image I have on the slide here, and each spot on this map I'm going to call a city. And inside each of these cities is the bottom screenshot here. Each of them contains 6 to 8 strongholds. And the strongholds are where the battles for this mode are actually going to take place. So once again, you got an overall map, you got the cities, and then you got the strongholds inside those cities. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, first I'm going to talk a little bit about how factions work in this mode. So some of you probably have already seen the interface that is available on Global. You can see it on the bottom screenshot right now. Uh, here you can slot in your favorite faction for your own account and also put favorite factions for each of the squads of your guild. Uh, and these preferred factions don't have any gameplay effect. Uh, they're pretty much there purely to make it so that more casual guilds can sort their members into the appropriate squad, you know, without needing to resort to things like Discord and all that. Uh, but anyway, the reason you might want to sort certain players with similar strong factions uh, into the same squad is because that at any given moment there are actually two bonus factions. So each city in this mode actually has a bonus faction associated with it, and each squad has a bonus faction associated with it. The bonus factions for the cities is set in place by the game. As far as I know, there's no way to change that, but the squad bonus faction is determined by the guild leader. And this is why you want to sort your members so that uh, maybe players that have very strong glory teams are all in the same squad, and maybe players that all have very strong dark teams are on the same squad, that sort of thing. Uh, now the bonuses you get from these two different bonuses are actually different. The bonus faction associated with the city increases your rewards by 10% per character, uh, whereas the bonus faction for the squad increases the stats of the characters of that faction by 10%. Uh, so you don't need to worry if, say, 
you're the only Origin of Light main in your guild. Maybe you'll miss out on the stat bonus for whichever squad you get sorted into, uh, but you don't need to worry about maybe missing out on the extra rewards, uh, because that's determined by the bonus faction of the city, and not the squad. So if you'll take a look at the top screenshot here, this is just a prep screen that I'll expand a little bit more on later, but for this particular screenshot, I had a bonus faction of Empire for the squad itself, and the city I was attacking had a bonus faction of Tensei. So you can see that, for example, Bernhardt, Sonia, Varna, etc. Uh, they have a bonus above their portrait that says uh, uh, stats increased. Like I said, the bonus faction for the squad is what determines extra stats. On the other hand, you have units like Renata, Ainz, and Albedo here, who are in the Tensei faction, and the text above their portrait says that you will get increased rewards if you deploy them. And finally, of course, you have Hilda, who has pink text above her, because she's in both Empire and Tensei factions, so she'll get both bonuses at once. Now, while getting one or both of these faction bonuses is really great, generally speaking on a Chinese server, I think a lot of players concluded that uh, you shouldn't really go way out of your way to be getting these bonuses if you don't have characters of the appropriate faction raised. Uh, the squad bonus faction only gives you 10% extra stats, uh, so it's not like deploying off faction is going to result in you being really, really weak. It's more important that you deploy your built characters so that you can make sure to clear the stages that you challenge in this mode. The final thing I want to note here is that faction buffs do not give stat buffs in this mode, uh, similar to Ancient Beckoning. If you cast a faction buff, the only buff you're going to get is the special effect. So that's something to keep in mind when you're playing co-op in this mode. You don't need to worry about, oh, who's bringing the faction buff? Uh, who, or is everybody bringing the same characters of the same faction? Uh, that sort of thing. So it's nice that they made it so that faction buffs aren't important in this mode. The most important thing, like I said, is to deploy your strongest units to make sure you can clear the mode adequately. And if you happen to get some of the bonuses, that's nice, but it's not the most important thing. Alright, now let's talk about the general progression of the mode. This is just an overview of the stages of the mode. It is split roughly into three phases. Uh, now one important thing I really want to note here is that once this mode starts, if you are booted from your guild, or if you leave your guild, you can't participate in this mode anymore even if you join a new guild. So if you are planning on guild hopping anytime soon, you should probably do it before this mode starts. So first we got phase 1, which is the organization stage. Uh, this part lasts 48 hours. At this point, the factions for each of the cities on the map will already be visible. So even though you cannot attack the cities yet, you can already start discussing with your guild who should go into which squad, uh, and which squad should go where in order to maximize uh, getting the right faction players to the right places. While you're playing out the route for each of your squads during this phase, one important thing to keep in mind is that if you surround a city with more than two squads at once, the stats of that city will increase significantly. So you don't want to just like take all four squads and all of them are attacking the same city because that just makes things harder without any sort of upside. So next we got phase two, which is force distribution. This phase of the mode lasts 24 hours, and it's at this point any guild members who are not in a squad will be forcibly sorted into one, and members in a squad already at this point cannot move between squads. It is however still possible to change the positioning and the pathing of each of your squads on the map. It's basically a final check of where everybody is going. And in phase 3 the battle begins, and as mentioned before, this lasts for 6 weeks. Now while it was not possible to move members between squads in phase 2, when you actually start playing the mode, it is actually possible to have some limited amount of mobility between the squads. It's actually possible for squad leaders to borrow members from other squads. Uh, the other squad leader has to approve, of course. Uh, there is a limited number of uses for this feature, but it is nice to have it there in case maybe one of the squads is running into trouble and maybe they need a stronger member of the guild to come and help them. Okay, so that's an overview of the basics of the mode out of the way. Before we go any further, I want to talk a little bit about the new items that are introduced in this mode. Hopefully by introducing these first, I can avoid as much confusion as possible when I start talking about the mode. So first you have this green logistics box. This restores a single hero's stamina so that they can start participating in battles again. I'll explain a little bit more about stamina in a second. These green logistic boxes are one of the most important items to ration in this mode. You can obtain more of them through the mode by conquering strongholds, but they're also given out for free each week of the event. Next we have these wooden boxes called battle supplies. Uh, these are an item only used by team leaders, and they use it to upgrade totems. Another thing I'll explain in a minute. Both the logistic boxes and the battle supplies cannot be saved for future runs of the event, so don't feel like you need to hoard them in case you're worried that maybe next time the mode will be a lot harder or something. You can't save them for next time anyway. So next we have the expedition points. This is not actually an item, this is more just the points that you earn while playing the mode. Uh, you obtain them by participating in battles yourself, and they're also rewarded to the entire guild anytime you conquer a stronghold or city. Uh, finally, you have these expedition badges. They come in blue and purple, and these are the actual currency you use to buy rewards. Okay, 
With that out of the way, let's talk about how each player is going to be setting up their own team. So unlike the Guild Wars that we're used to, you're actually not allowed to use your entire barracks in this mode. When you first start up this mode, you are prompted to set up your character box of 15 units. Kind of similar to an Apex box, but obviously you're going to be building a little bit different because uh, this is PvE and you can deploy six of them at once. So while this box started as a 15 character box, in the second week of the event they actually expanded the box to have 25 units instead. And while that's nice, it actually doesn't affect it as much as you might think. Uh, which you'll see why in a second. So don't worry too much when you're doing the initial setup of your box. You'll be able to switch out the characters as much as you want until you actually deploy them in battle. Once you deploy the character in the box into battle, that character is locked in and you're not allowed to switch them out. So each character in your box is going to have two stamina points. It's going to be represented by a bar below their portrait on some screens. But basically, each time you deploy one of them on a map, they will lose one stamina point. And when they have zero stamina, they can't be deployed anymore. In other words, you are only allowed to deploy each of these characters twice. And unlike in normal Guild Wars, the stamina does not regenerate with daily resets. Once it's zero, it's going to stay at zero until you restore it through the use of a logistic box uh, that I mentioned just the previous page. So if you stop here for a second and think about it, what this means is that you actually have a limited number of tries to complete this mode. You cannot just play it infinitely and hope to clear it all just by figuratively ramming your head against the wall, basically. You should try your best to deploy your best units, and you should actually play the game. You can't just auto your way through it. I mean, you can, but uh, that will result in poorer scores, you're going to be wasting your characters, and you're probably not going to clear the mode if everybody's just autoing. Alright, now we got the team set up on Let's talk about actually playing this mode, attacking cities. So on the world map, the squad leaders need to select attack on a city before any of the members can actually start playing the mode. Uh, so this is why it's actually very important that the squad leaders are around, that they don't take an extended vacation during the mode or something. You do need them around to actually press the button and say attack the city before anybody else can do anything. Now even though whatever squad you're in is probably going to be locked into a specific city at any given moment, any player can look at the entire map at any time they want and they can look up pretty much all the info you can ask for. You'll be able to check the other cities that are unlocked and see all the info of all the strongholds inside and get a look at how the other squads are progressing and that sort of thing. Uh, you won't be able to look at things like the inner ring cities or the capital until you unlock them though. So as I mentioned briefly before, as you conquer strongholds in a given city, uh, you're going to get extra logistic boxes so they can restore stamina to your characters. You're going to get battle supplies which can be used to improve totems. Uh, again, I'm going to explain what totems are later in the video. Uh, but it's worth noting that these Stronghold Conquering rewards are only rewarded to the squad that contributed the most to conquering that Stronghold. So the Logistic Boxes, Battle Supply, and Totem rewards are not a guild-wide reward. They are given to the squad that contributed the most to conquering that specific Stronghold. As you conquer Strongholds, there is also going to be a progression bar at the top of the screen. You can see it right here on the top screenshot. This is the progression bar for conquering the entire city. As you conquer more of the city, or conquer more of the strongholds in the city rather, you are going to be unlocking each of the chests you see there, and they usually give things like expedition points, which as I mentioned earlier, uh, as you get more expedition points, your rank in the mode increases, and you get the blue expedition badges from that. In addition, these chests also give the purple expedition badges. Uh, now these rewards that you get from the chests uh, along the top of the screen there, these are actually given to the entire guild. So to sum up a little bit of what I just said, uh, the rewards that are shared within the guild are the ones that actually lead to you getting the currency to buy stuff from the shop. The ones that are restricted only to the squad that conquered certain strongholds, that's more the rewards that get you things that let you play the mode more, like logistic boxes and stuff. So next you can take a look at the bottom screenshot here. This is just the info screen that comes up when you click on one of the strongholds and you're ready to start playing the mode. There's a lot of info on the screen, so I'm going to try to run you through all of it. So first in the top left here, you can see the level of the stronghold. You can see how much life is left in the stronghold. And you can also see a special rule for a stronghold. Uh, this is basically the same as a timeless trial law. On this screenshot, for example, this law says that the enemies will take 50% reduced AoE damage. Right below it is some info about the fight itself. It tells you what kind of map this is, and I'm going to explain each type of map later on. It also tells you a little bit about what type of enemies you're going to be fighting. So for example, right here, it says uh, this map has endless waves of enemies and uh, you're going to be fighting monsters. Uh, like for example, vampire bats, wolves, lava titans, that sort of thing. Below it are the rewards from the stronghold. As mentioned before, you get logistic boxes, battle supplies, and a totem. 
and to the right of all of this is the status of your own team. Uh, here there are buttons for you to use the logistic boxes on maybe heroes that you have uh, that are out of stamina. You can change the totem that you are currently using. And of course there are buttons to say start the map solo or start the map in co-op. Alright, now let's talk about what different types of strongholds there actually are. So even though it looks like there's a lot of stages in this mode, 6 to 8 strongholds with all those cities, there's actually really only 3 types of maps in this mode. Now first off, I should mention that out of those 6 to 8 strongholds in each city, there is one that is a boss stronghold. When you defeat the boss stronghold, you instantly conquer the city, but if you do not defeat the other strongholds around it first, the boss will have increased stats. So generally speaking, it's not really advised for you to be going straight for a boss. You should probably just defeat the other strongholds and then go for the boss. Anyway, as I mentioned a second ago, there are three types of strongholds. There are small groups, large groups, and 50-man groups. I'll try to show clips of each one of these so you can get an idea of what they might look like. So first you have the small group maps. On these maps, there's endless waves of enemies, and they come in small groups, as you might imagine. You have 10 turns to kill as many enemies as possible, and obviously, the more enemies you kill, the more points you get. On these small group maps, two enemies will appear, and then one stronger enemy will appear. And it'll just repeat that over and over until the map ends. The large group maps are similar to the small group maps in that there are infinite waves of enemies, but as the name suggests, they come in larger groups of 5 to 7 enemies and they just spawn over and over until the map ends. Finally, you have the 15 man group maps. On these maps, you have to defeat 15 enemies within 10 turns, and these are separated into 3 waves of 5 pretty strong enemies each time. Pretty much every single map in this mode is going to be one of these types of maps, even the boss ones. All right. I've been teasing it for a while now, so let's talk about the totems now. Now if I was to literally translate their name, they would be something like space-time arrays. The reason I'm calling them totems is because that's what they're referred to as in the game files. And usually when they bring things over to global, uh, a lot of times they just use the game file name for the English name. Uh, probably the most egregious example of this is the fact that Akaya ended up being called Akka in global version. But anyway, whatever they end up calling them, let's just call them totems for now. That's the simpler name. So there are many different types of totems, but they are separated generally into four elements, fire, earth, water, and dark. They are essentially a bonus buff that you equip onto your entire team. So each one of these totems has a special effect, and all of them have some way for you to inflict an elemental debuff. Now, as mentioned before, you obtain new totems uh, by clearing strongholds with your squad, uh, but there is actually also a way to power up these totems. And here is another responsibility for the squad leaders. The squad leaders are responsible for deciding how to spend the battle supplies that you get to upgrade which totems. This is pretty important because different totems have different bonuses. Now, some of them are more tailored to single target strategies and some of them are more tailored to AoE strategies and you kind of need both of them while playing this mode. So for example, on the left here I have two totems just as an example of what these totems might look like. Uh, on the left I have this fire totem. It says uh, it increases the AoE damage of your units by 50%. And it also says, before dealing damage, uh, you have a 60% chance of inflicting one stack of a fire element onto the enemies. So this is a more AoE focused totem. Whereas next to it, I have a dark totem. This dark totem says, before actively attacking and entering battle, reduce the enemy's attack and intelligence by 8% and have a guaranteed chance to give them one stack of a dark element. This of course is a single target focused totem. I should also note that in this example, this Shadow Totem is a much lower level than the Fire Totem, which is why the Fire Totem looks a lot stronger. Uh, but it's important for your squad leaders to understand uh, what kind of strategies are the members going for, because if you start upgrading an AoE Totem and all your members are doing single target strategies, then you're not really helping anybody. In addition, it's important that you upgrade a variety of elements, uh, because one of the gimmicks of this mode is when you inflict two elemental debuffs on an enemy, it will cause an elemental reaction, uh, because I guess the Zalone devs have been spending too much time playing Genshin Impact recently. So I have listed all the different elemental reactions you can get down here. So let's just go through them real quick. If you do a double fire, water, or earth effect, you will get a 5% HP fixed damage tick, and then you will also get an additional effect. Uh, the fire plus fire will cause curse of wounding for one turn, water plus water will dispel two buffs, and the earth plus earth one will give the movement minus one for one turn, but this can stack up to three times so you can give them movement minus three if you do the reaction over and over. And double dark element uh, causes them to lose attack and intelligence, which is stackable. Fire plus water causes them to lose defensive magic defense by 15% for one turn, and this can stack. 
Dark plus fire uh, reduces your defense for one turn. Dark plus water reduces your magic defense for one turn. Uh, all of these can stack. Uh, earth plus fire causes them to take increased physical damage, and earth plus water causes them to take increased magical damage. Again, these can stack. Finally, you have earth plus dark, which causes them to just take 15% extra all damage for one turn. Now, many of you might remember now that I mentioned that each player can only equip one totem at a time. And when you look at this elemental reaction system, it tells you a lot about the intent of the developer here. They clearly want us to play co-op way more in this mode, because if you look at the pure elemental reactions here, they're a lot weaker than the ones of mixed elements. And remember, two of the three map types, you have to clear endless waves of enemies within 10 turns, and the more points you get, the better rewards you get. Now, these elemental reactions aren't required for you to be able to clear as many enemies as possible, uh, but the advantage of being able to inflict all damage taken plus 15% or whatever with an AoE from two different players and then having the third player take advantage of that, with the right rate coordination, that's a pretty significant increase in the damage you're dealing. Alright, let's get to the part which I think a lot more people are interested in, which is the rewards. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are two types of currency in this mode that can be acquired, uh, which is the blue expedition badges and the purple expedition badges. Uh, on the left here you can see the entire shop of items you can exchange for using those badges. Uh, not a lot to say here, just a lot of really nice rewards, SSR accessory, enchant scrolls, rune stones, trinity vouchers, SP hero shards, challenge points, uh, surge stones, it's all here. Now the thing I want to note here is that if you're a casual player and you're really really concerned about whether or not you can get SP behind, uh, in my opinion, if you play by yourself without your guildies, you should be able to get enough points to afford the SP Hero Shard for Hein. It's unlikely you'll be able to afford everything, probably not even close to that. I mean, it really depends on how far your entire guild gets within the mode. But unless you are just completely new to the game and you don't have a lot of very strong characters yet, I wouldn't be concerned about, oh, I'm not going to be able to get SP Hein at all. I don't think that's going to happen to a lot of people. But you probably don't want to be spending on stuff you don't really need. Like, don't buy stuff like the Magic Ooze and stuff. Save it for stuff you really need if you're a more casual player and there is something specific you want from the shop. And for most people, I think it's going to be the SP Hind Shard. That's probably the most unique reward here. So last but certainly not least, let's talk about the ranking rewards. So there is a guild versus guild ranking for this mode. And as you can see from the screenshot at the bottom there, the reward for being the top guild is a ton of enchant scrolls, uh, a ton of guild points and trinity crystals, and of course, being slightly below that, you know, you still get plenty of those as well. Everybody in the guild gets those rewards. So if you really want these, you better psych up your guild and get them ready to compete. Because all the top guilds in this game are probably going to be working really hard to get those shining enchant scrolls especially. So the ranking here is determined by how much magic ore that you obtain during the mode. Uh, the magic ore is obtained by defeating enemies. That's it. Uh, so basically, uh, you do better at the mode, and you get a higher ranking. It's that simple. Now, as far as I know, the ranking is separated by server. So, for example, uh, the right screenshot here, uh, my guild actually ended up in ninth place on our server, uh, even though we barely made it past the first ring. And one of the reasons for that is because the server I decided to make my Chinese account on is a relatively new one. So pretty much all the players on that server are relatively weak. There was just one guild that, that completed the whole thing. So from this I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that the guild ranking here is probably by server or at worst a couple service bonds together. So you know if you're a guild on Emerald Gate or something you don't need to worry about needing to compete with a guild from Rocky Valley or something. I'm pretty sure that's not going to be the case. Okay and I think that is all I got for all of you today. Thank you for watching and I hope this video was helpful for all of you to start getting ready for this mode. It took me a while to make this video, but if you still have any questions, be sure to ask them below and I'll try my best to answer them. At the end of the day, I'm still limited by what I was able to experience myself in this mode and some of the info I was able to gather from other players. But again, I hope this video helped you and your guild get ready to tackle this mode. Good luck, and if you're on Salrath, may the best guild get the most scrolls. See you guys next time.